I called it the forgotten flagship because unfortunately HMAS Australia One had a rather checkered career, even though it was a very much a beloved ship. So I thought it would only be natural to put another presentation together about the next flagship and the last one to bear the name Australia. And of course that is HMAS Australia Two. So we're gonna look at the career of this ship. We're gonna look at the actual um, structure of the ship and the specifications. We're also going to look at the history of the ship and we'll just get right into it now. So the best source I found uh, for information, apart from some other stuff, is Mike Carlton's book, Flagship. Uh, it is, of course, mainly about HMAS Australia too, but you'll find information there about HMAS Canberra and the subsequent uh, heavy cruiser that was given to us when Canberra was lost, HMAS Shropshire. It's an excellent read and I recommend it to you. So here is an overview of what we're going to be looking at today. So first of all, we're gonna start off by uh, checking out how the Royal Australian Navy was faring after World War I. And um, then we're going to look at the reasons why we needed another HMAS Australia. And then we're going to look at the actual specifications and the ship itself, the heavy cruiser HMAS Australia. We're going to look at the early career of the ship from the time it uh, came to Australia up until the beginning of World War II. Um, there was a bit of controversy. Um, there was also a world cruise. That's pretty interesting within itself. And then of course, we begin by looking at HMAS Australia career in World War II uh, from 1940 to 41. And then after the Pearl Harbor bombing, how HMAS Australia came to the Pacific and participated in many campaigns right up until uh, 1945. And we'll briefly look at what happened to the ship after the war. And as you can see there, there is the badge for HMAS Australia, which was the same badge, obviously, as the first HMAS Australia. Okay, so we're going to start off by looking at what was really the sorrow of a nation, that is HMAS Australia One being scuttled off Sydney Heads. Um, it was almost like a funeral. Uh, many people uh, were mourning the loss of this ship. Indeed, there were many people who protested having to do this. Why should we sink this ship that we spent so much money and that was the symbol of our nation, especially before World War I, when we put together the first Royal Australian Navy squadron, um, a capital ship, a battle cruiser, something that many other nations could only dream of having. But in the end, uh, due to the Washington Conference, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the Disarmament Conference, and under the instructions of the Admiralty and the British government, um, and you, you must also say it had a lot to do with the fact that it was quite expensive uh, to run. The ship was scuttled off Sydney Heads. So that kind of left a bit of a, um, a gap in what we're going to do with the Navy, because as we'll see, it wasn't just HMAS Australia that was got rid of. So what are we going to do with our Navy? Okay, so Admiral Jellicoe, the famous commander of the Grand Fleet during the first half of World War I, and of course the commander of the Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland, who was known as the only man who could lose the war in an afternoon. And I'd just like to say something about that. Many people consider this um, epithet by, I think it was Churchill actually, when he wrote his history of the Great War, uh, to be a bit of a slur. However, other historians look at this in a different way. The fact is, he could have lost the war in an afternoon if he had not been perhaps as cautious as he was. Um, 
the German shooting at the Battle of Jutland was outstanding. I think the loss of three British battle cruisers in quick succession probably bears that out. And he didn't get a lot of information from the admiral in charge of the battle cruisers, uh, David Beatty, who was busy chasing the Germans all, all over the place. And yet he was able to uh, maneuver the Grand Fleet, the battleships of the Grand Fleet, to cross the T of the Germans, not once but twice. So I know I'm banging on about this a little bit, but I think the guy gets some pretty bad press. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so the Australian Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, asked Jellicoe to advise. Uh, Australia, especially <laughs> Billy Hughes himself, was pretty uh, fearful of Japan, a powerful growing empire. And after the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Japan was able to secure many island bases that were pretty close to Australian territory. Um, so Admiral Jellicoe gave us some excellent advice. I don't know if he was like um, being funny or he just really meant this, that the Royal Australian Navy should consist of at least 16 dreadnoughts. That would be eight battleships, eight battle cruisers, and 40 armored and light cruisers. So that would have made Australia one of the most powerful navies in the world. And of course, that would have been absolutely, totally impossible for us to achieve. Um, it would have been wonderful if we could. But uh, again, the um, Washington Naval Conference would not have allowed that. And uh, he also alluded to the fact that Singapore would one day become the main base of the British Empire in Asia. And of course, the main Royal Navy base in this part of the world. And indeed, that was achieved. Unfortunately, it didn't last for long. So the Royal Australian Navy post-World War I. Okay, the fleet was shrinking in ships and men due to cost. So the emphasis for the government had a lot to do with the soldiers from the AIF returning from World War I and what could be done for them. Uh, many people understandably thought because, you know, Australia is a peace-loving democracy. Why do we need to maintain such a fleet of ships? That was the war to end all wars, wasn't it? We don't really need to have this, and it's so expensive, and therefore the government began to neglect uh, bases, equipment, and the working conditions uh, went pretty severely down, which meant that not only uh, were people being retrenched, but people just basically left the service uh, to pursue other types of work. And then in 1924, funnily enough, the same year in which HMAS Australia 1 was scuttled, the Bruce government decided, mm, maybe we need to build up our defences. Uh, partly this was because of the media. As I said before, there was a great fear of uh, Japan. Um, there was a great fear of Asia um, all around, basically. Um, so the government started to heed this. And the fact is that we needed some major fleet units and HMAS Australia and HMAS Canberra were ordered with the John Brown shipyard, which was on the Clyde in Scotland, uh, but not without some protest because at this time, uh, Cockatoo Island was thinking that they could build the ships here, uh, not necessarily the ships that we ended up with, but their own design. And we're gonna have a look at that right now. So this is the HMAS Australia II that we might have had if the ships were built here. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, British cruisers from World War I, but this design was based on an enlarged Hawkins class uh, cruiser. It's one of the class of cruisers that were coming towards the end. Um, it was a transition between the old armored cruisers uh, and, and the actual heavy cruisers that um, ended up being built 
Um, it's interesting to see the design, uh, triple turrets, triple eight inch turrets, which uh, is definitely pretty un-British, uh, much more American. Uh, a funny sort of um, mixture of secondary armament in casemates. You can see the, the casemates on the plan view um, towards the stern and the bow. Um, and also secondary anti-aircraft guns and torpedo tubes. Um, the government was uh, basically rejecting this on the grounds that it would cost too much and we need to, you know, maintain our links with Britain. And Britain was very keen that we should spend our money in their dockyards. And to be honest, this ship probably would have been fairly outdated by the time World War II came around. But it's a fascinating what if. So let's cut to John Brown's shipyard and 1927 and the launching of HMAS Australia II. Um, nothing untoward happened. The ship took to the water very nicely. And as you can see there, it has beautiful uh, sweeping fine lines and everybody was quite happy with the actual launch. And another photograph of the ship being fitted out, uh, nearing its completion. The turrets have not been mounted yet, nor has the secondary armament, etc. cetera. But um, most of the superstructure is there. And as I say, it's very interesting to note how the funnels were actually quite short to begin with compared to how they ended up. Um, one of the um, nicknames for the British county class cruisers, which of course HMAS Australia was part of the county class, uh, was a packet of woodbines because the um, long funnels that eventuated looked like, um, you know, some cigarettes sticking out of a packet, I suppose. And um, yeah, HMAS Australia was part of the Kent subclass of cruiser, uh, which was part of the county class. And here's a beautiful shot of HMAS Australia passing under the yet to be completed Harbour Bridge. Uh, so that really dates exactly uh, when that is uh, in 1930 and sailing into the harbour itself, uh, beautifully resp resplendent, a, a clean ship, um, everything ship shape. And of course, almost exactly like HMAS Australia One, the ship and its crew became a big draw and a big celebrity for the people, not only of Sydney, but many other Australian cities as well. And we see this here. The ship was on show to the public at Circular Quay. And I always love to see photographs like this to see how people used to dress. And um, of course, every man who is a civilian is wearing a hat because hats were obligatory for males. The um, fashions for the ladies, it must have been a bit blustery and windy there. But um, yeah, the ship was on show for quite a few days and drew record crowds. And, and so it should have been because obviously the Australian taxpayer was footing the bill. So what were these ships for? What were the main roles and tasks? These are heavy cruisers. Um, they are almost a capital ship in power. Uh, so what are they there for? First of all, to serve as the flagships for the squadrons of the fleet. So you have two of these ships. That means that the projected uh, light cruisers, destroyers, etc., that would be built um, could be divided up into two separate commands. You could, and each one of these could be a flagship with a, you know, a flag officer in charge. Of course, that's not how it ended up, uh, but that's what you say, you know, the best laid plans. Of course, it was very advantageous for the Royal Navy to have Australia, and I might add actually, that in World War II um, and before World War II, 
uh, Australia really had pretty much the only um, sizable navy in the British Empire apart from England itself. Uh, Canada and New Zealand, uh, South Africa, although they had some uh, light cruisers and etc., cetera, um, Australia really had something that was effective. And the British Navy looked upon these ships uh, as suitable escorts for the capital ships, meaning battleships, battle cruisers, and aircraft carriers of any Royal Navy Far East fleet. And of course, the classic uh, roles of cruisers to protect troop and merchant shipping. Uh, we all know, of course, the famous story of HMAS Sydney in World War I being detached from a troop convoy to sink the Emden. So these ships would also uh, have that role. And indeed, they did do that at the beginning of World War II. Um, also, the hunting of enemy raiders, cruisers, and patrol of sea lanes. It might be um, interesting to speculate uh, what would have happened to the Cormoran if uh, it had run into Australia or Canberra. I mean, even HMAS Sydney um, should have had the, uh, the power to quickly sink Cormoran, but HMAS Australia and HMAS Canberra would undoubtedly blasted the Cormoran out of the water. And the last um, role is to obviously show the flag and to foster goodwill in Australia and abroad. And again, we will see that that was done. Here is an excellent, um, here's an excellent plan view, et cetera, and side view of the ship as it was uh, around 1930. It's not cluttered with secondary armament. Indeed, the secondary armament of the ship, as we'll see, is pretty sparse with some four inch guns. Um, and altogether, uh, it, it is a ship at this stage that is uh, typical of its class during the early 1930s. So a few facts about the ship, and we're gonna start now looking at the ship itself and the specifications. First of all, the motto, Endeavour, the same as HMAS Australia One. And of course, that does hark back to Captain James Cook and the famous Bark Endeavour that um, helped to put Australia on the map. Uh, I mentioned before the Washington Naval Conference. And one of the things to come out of that Naval Conference was that Heavy cruisers should not exceed 10,000 tons in design displacement. Now, the fact is that um, countries like Japan and Germany, definitely, uh, when they ended up designing their heavy cruisers in the mid 30s, they well exceeded 10,000 tons, uh, 12 to 13 to even 14,000 tons for some of the really quite big Japanese heavy cruisers. Um, but of course, um, you know, Britain and America kind of towed the line. Uh, however, they were still very effective ships on that load. And at deep load, the ship would weigh 13,630 tons approximately. Uh, it, it had a length of 630 feet, which is interesting to note, which is just as long as HMS Dreadnought in World War I. So quite a large ship compared to some of the World War I ships, a beam of 68.5 feet. And I'm gonna use um, feet, I'm gonna use the Imperial measurements, but I do have the metric measurements next to it if you wanna look at it. And this is very interesting. The original crew, 679 men as a flagship, obviously you have an Admiral aboard, you would have more people on his staff. But by 1945, um, the crew had increased to 1,300 men. And that was primarily because of the increased anti-aircraft armament that was necessary to fight in the Pacific. And it became a very cramped ship uh, by the end of World War II. And a few figures money-wise. So the ship was built as part of a 36 million pound defense upgrade. And it's interesting to see that 
that will correspond to well over $4.2 billion in today's money. Main armament of the ship, eight inch 50 caliber guns. You can see there, uh, maximum range 29,900, shell weight 256 pounds. So uh, a little bit less than what I weigh. So I'll, I'll leave you to think about that. Uh, muzzle velocity of 2,805 feet per second. Okay, so a rifle bullet like uh, a 303 or an American 306 or a German eight millimeter Mauser will leave the barrel at around that velocity. So here you are firing guns of a caliber, not of 30 caliber, but of eight inches at the same velocity as a rifle. So that's pretty fast and it could penetrate up to five to six inches of armor quite easily. Elevation, minus four depression to 70 degrees elevation. And of course, the guns were mounted in four turrets, uh, A turret, B turret at the bow and X and Y at the stern. And that's the actual uh, terminology used by the British and Australian navies. Secondary armament to begin with were four inch guns of pretty much a World War I type of design. You can see there, there is no protection for the crew. Um, you stand out on the open to operate the guns. Um, the fact is that in World War I, um, and these are dual purpose guns, aircraft were pretty slow, comparatively speaking, and you could almost quite easily track the aircraft with these old fashioned guns. Uh, unfortunately, by the time of World War II, they were quite obsolete. Although luckily for HMS Australia, uh, these guns were no longer there because they had switched to these guns. So uh, twin mountings, there were four of these, uh, two on each side of the ship. They had much better range. Uh, they had much better everything pretty much, okay? Bigger shell weight, bigger, better muzzle velocity. Um, and of course, being dual purpose, could be used against surface targets or against aerial targets as well. Uh, an ubiquitous gun mounting that was found all throughout uh, the British Navy. And uh, some of the smaller weapons, if you look to the left, uh, to begin with HMS Australia was armed with the 50 caliber Vickers machine gun. Uh, typically they were mounted uh, of four guns in one mounting. Um, unfortunately, they're pretty ineffective against modern aircraft and they were as soon as possible replaced during World War II. Uh, on the right, um, HMAS Australia would be equipped with two quadruple torpedo mounts. And it's interesting, um, the ideas that were prevalent um, in World War I and between World War I and World War II where torpedoes were mounted not only on destroyers, which is pretty normal, but on light cruisers, which is acceptable. And on heavy cruisers, battleships, battle cruisers, um, quite a mania for torpedoes. And I, I think as far as I can tell, um, torpedoes on heavy warships uh, were pretty useless. I think the only capital ship in World War II to fire torpedoes at another capital ship was when HMS Rodney uh, fired a spread of torpedoes at Bismarck, which was already a flaming shambles and could hardly move and missed. So during world, the latter part of World War II, the torpedoes were removed uh, in favor of more anti-aircraft armament. And more effective anti-aircraft armament, you can see here, uh, quad two pounder pom-poms. Uh, these were again, uh, a British design and again, fairly ubiquitous on many British warships. They were a definite improvement over the Vickers machine gun, but you cannot shoot a kamikaze out of the sky with one of these if it's really gonna um, crash into your ship. 
it has a fairly low muzzle velocity uh, compared to the 40 millimeter Bofors and even the 20 millimeter Orlicon. And so while it was not too bad at close distance, um, there were better effective uh, weapons. And you can see on the right there, um, the fellows towards the end of the war using the 40 millimeter Bofors, uh, which was sourced from the United States Navy, pretty much because the Royal Navy um, ignored or couldn't be bothered to give these guns to us. We look at the armor of the ship itself. So this is direct from Jane's fighting ships. Um, typical heavy cruiser type armor, a main belt of three to five inches, okay, along this straight here. Turrets, uh, two inches, barbettes, two inches, uh, conning tower of, of three inches, and deck armor of four inches, which um, actually was pretty good compared to ships in World War I. And this reflected the fact that um, as, as warships could fire accurately at longer distances, the shells would land um, onto the horizontal areas of the ship rather than the sides of the ship. So any ships that had weak deck armor could be easily pierced and there could have be uh, catastrophic um, um, results. Okay, so also there were anti-torpedo bulges fitted, which was again another idea and many warships had this. Propulsion, okay, so three drum type bo boilers, 80,000 shaft horsepower for a design speed of 32 knots. Uh, an amazing combat radius at full speed of 2,300 miles. Uh, obviously, if you were not traveling so fast, that radius would be exceeded. And it's interesting to note, if you have a look at the um, photograph on the bottom right, um, oil fuel had changed engine rooms a hell of a lot. Uh, and the same photo for HMAS Australia 1 in the same section showed a bunch of um, grubby looking fellows with shovels and coal and coal dust all over the place. And I'm sure you're all familiar how hard it was to um, load coal when you were coaling um, on a World War I ship, dirty, filthy business. Um, now the fellows were operating in a much cleaner environment. Oil fuel, of course, was something that was much more efficient than coal. And the old sweats, the old sailors who had served during World War I um, couldn't believe their luck when they saw this kind of operation and um, thank the Lord that they were old enough to see this change. Now we're going to have a look at how the crew was faring on the ship. Uh, because you've got to remember in 1929, 1930, 1931, Australia, as well as most of the world, was in the grip of the Great Depression. So in Australia, it hit pretty hard. There was a big economic downturn. And one of the things that the sailors resented, and there was a list of things that they resented, was the fact that they had to take a pay cut. Now, many of these men had families, whether they were helping to support their parents and brothers and sisters, or they were newly married and had a small family of their own, perhaps, to support. And, of course, in those days, there was no such thing as um, monetary welfare. Um, there was no, <coughs> pardon me, there was no um, monetary uh, compensation for people who lost their jobs, etc. And to take a pay cut was something that was very much resented. There was an incident aboard the ship that also caused more unrest. A very respected senior petty officer, Dickerson, that the crew um, very much liked, uh, had been showing new uh, crew members' 
in the use of the, I think it was one of the four inch um, secondary guns. And a young midshipman came along, uh, stood there quizzically looking at Dickerson and then proceeded to upbraid him. And this fellow was very young, a midshipman talking to a senior, senior sailor in very rude terms. Dickerson apparently just stood there looking at this young man. And when he had finished his tirade, Dickerson, and this is all he said, uh, words to the effect, well, fancy a young man like you telling someone like me how to do my job. So this was not, um, this was not ignored. Uh, Dickerson was put up on a charge. He uh, was punished. And the crew felt that this was very unfair and just another, uh, how can we say, another reason to um, have um, resentment and to uh, make their feelings known. Uh, at the same time, there was this perception, as I wrote there, that the officers themselves, and many of them were actually British officers still, uh, were living in luxury. They were not taking um, the kind of hit that the sailors were. Um, they were able to provide for their families. They believed that discipline was absolutely too harsh. Um, you know, I mean, the fact is that many officers uh, were having their wedding receptions on the quarter deck of the ship under the awning, and the sailors were impressed to become servants to serve out um, some really delicious food that they themselves could never eat. And of course, that, that their families could never even hope to have. And so again, more unrest, more resentment. And something that they heard about that happened in England at this time was the Invergordon mutiny. Um, when you think of mutiny, right, you think of Fletcher Christian and people being shot and thrown overboard and all this sort of stuff. Invergordon mutiny was more really of sailors going on strike uh, for pretty much the same resentment and reasons why the Australian sailors were not happy. Um, and of course, in some circumstances, the Invergordon mutiny was tolerated to a little extent, but um, people here were very worried that something very similar would happen. And then we got this fellow. So we had a new Rear Admiral in charge of the Royal Australian Navy. His name was Rear Admiral Lane Poole. And pretty soon uh, his name would be uh, changed by the Australian sailors to Rear Admiral Bloody Fool. So he comes aboard HMAS Australia, it's his flagship, and he begins to alienate the sailors and not just the sailors themselves, but his superiors on the naval board as well. He had a very um, superior attitude. He believed that um, he was always right and everybody else was always wrong. Um, and so therefore he didn't win many friends uh, either in the ranks or even in the higher ranks above him. And to cap it all off, his wife, Sigrid. So, you know, I mean, that, that's a name that invokes uh, the Valkyries. I don't know. I tried to find a photo of her somewhere, but I couldn't find one. When she came aboard the ship, she actually started telling the sailors off as well. Now, she might be the wife of an admiral, but she certainly was not a ranking officer. And this was not taken too well by the Aussie crew men at all. And so what happened is that there were some acts of petty vandalism and sabotage by a few sailors. And it became obvious to the um, uh, officers on the Naval Board that there had been political agitation of some of these sailors. Okay, one of the things they also remembered, not just about the Invergordon mutiny, but the, uh, the German Navy at the end of World War I that actually mutinied because of communist agitation. And there was a fear that communists 
which existed pretty strongly in Australia in the 1930s, uh, could be agitating the Australian sailors. But all in all, even though it was wrong and it shouldn't have happened, uh, things like basically cutting cables, um, throwing ropes and, and equipment overboard, um, it was pretty petty stuff compared to what happened in the German Navy. And of course, uh, as far as the Naval Board were concerned, Lane Poole uh, is in charge of the fleet and in charge of the sailors and is supposed to be managing the situation and he wasn't. So he received the severe displeasure of the Naval Board and they were pretty glad eventually to get rid of him. Uh, funnily enough, Lane Poole um, ended up emigrating to Australia after World War II and uh, lived in Armidale until his death. So what are we going to do? Because you know, the media had got onto this story about supposed vandalism, etc. I know, let's send the ship on a world cruise. Let's get the sailors and, and everybody else and the ship itself out of the public eye. And at the same time, there was a number of reasons for this and we'll see what they were. And you can see here, this really was a world cruise, a circumnavigation, and we'll see some of the sites and personalities involved in this. So first of all, one of the main reasons was the fellow on the right, the Duke of Gloucester, the son of George V, who was um, the uncle of our present queen. And he was a royal passenger. He had been serving here um, as uh, governor general, I, I think. And he was going back to England and what better way than in one of the units of the Aust Royal Australian Navy. Um, if you look at that portrait, you might think that his eyes look pretty kind of glazed. He's got like, this sort of strange look about him. And that could be because apparently the man was uh, very fond of the bottle and chain smoked and um, he had some strange proclivities. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, one of the highlights, if you look at the left below, uh, was the transit of the Panama Canal. And you can see there HMAS Australia uh, transiting through. Uh, many people or many crew members had heard of the Panama Canal, but being young sailors, many of them had never actually transited through. And before that, of course, they had crossed the equator and they had um, King Neptune to appease, etc. So it was kind of a, a festive trip. And once they got to England and they offloaded the Duke of Gloucester, uh, HMAS Australia uh, took part in one of the last Royal Navy fleet reviews. Uh, when I say the last, I should say one of the last that was really something impressive to see. So on, on the right-hand column, uh, you have the British battleships uh, with Rodney and Nelson in, in the lead, followed by the ships what, that look like in those days of the Queen Elizabeth class going all the way down. On the left, uh, you see another line of battleships there, the foreign ships. Um, I think the first ship is actually the Marino or the River Davia, which is a South American battleship, uh, and a couple of French battleships and so on and so forth, and a whole line of cruisers, etc. And HMAS Australia would have been in those rear lines somewhere. Um, an absolutely magnificent sight it must have been. But while HMAS Australia was in England, it would undergo a refit which was um, much needed. And one of the things that would be included now was the um, Supermarine Seagull Amphibian. Uh, the Admiralty was definitely becoming very air-minded uh, in the 1930s. Um, a number of ships had already been converted into aircraft carriers or were building as aircraft carriers. And Many of the uh, battleships uh, and battle cruisers, etc., and heavy cruisers would be, and even light cruisers, were being fitted out with these 
light amphibian aircraft uh, for spotting and reconnaissance. So you can spot the fall of your shells and um, you can fire more accurately. Uh, just hope that um, there's not an enemy aircraft carrier around with fighter planes on board, or if you're firing at shore targets, that there's no uh, enemy fighters because unfortunately the seagull um, is pretty much dead meat if it's caught by a proper fighter plane. And this would actually happen, unfortunately. So if you have a look uh, at the photograph on the left, you'll also see um, the installation here of torpedo tubes. Um, the torpedo tubes would be moved around quite a bit from different areas uh, until eventually they were removed, as I said before. And um, you can also see in this, this area here, the new four inch guns, um, they're actually covered at the moment, so you can't actually see the guns themselves, uh, but they were also fitted during this time. And so after the refit, HMAS Australia would become part of the Royal Navy Mediterranean fleet. Um, and you can see there the same configuration. Um, of interest are the red, white, and blue rec aerial recognition. And the aerial recognition was uh, much needed because during the Spanish Civil War, uh, Royal Navy ships were on trade protection and some Royal Navy ships had been bombed by both um, the Spanish Republicans and the Spanish uh, Royalists. And so therefore um, they wanted to show that, hey, we're British or we're French because the French were also involved, don't bomb us. So that was a bit of an interesting cruise in the Mediterranean. And eventually HMAS Australia comes back and it's a beautiful shot of the ship in Sydney Harbour in 1939, in the last days of peace before the onset of the war in Europe. So how did HMAS Australia go to war and what happened in the first months uh, of the war itself? Well, not a lot happened. First of all, the ship is now commanded by Captain Ross Stewart, a Scotsman, very skilled, uh, an excellent seaman and ship handler. Okay, the first things that HMAS Australia 2 was involved in was convoy duties uh, in conjunction with HMAS Canberra. Uh, and this was done taking troops to the Middle East in convoy before joining the Royal Navy in the Atlantic theater. So as before, all our best ships, and fair enough, there was not a threat in the Pacific at this stage, but all our best ships were summoned by the Royal Navy and obediently they were sent to join the British fleet. And one of the first actions in which HMAS Australia was involved in was uh, a patrol off the coast of Western Africa near Dakar. And HMAS Australia was with the small aircraft carrier HMS Hermes, and it came under attack by Vichy French planes. Now, a quick word in case you don't know, uh, when France was invaded by Germany and France unfortunately fell in six weeks, uh, there was a small part of France in the south uh, with a government in the small town of Vichy that was allowed to exist as a separate French zone and to the north, the Germans occupied the rest of France. So the Vichy French still had control of the Navy and a small army and a small air force and was tolerated by the Germans. Now, a lot of young Aussies aboard the ship when they found out the French were attacking them, didn't understand like, well, aren't they supposed to be on our side? And of course it was explained to them, yes, well, they were on our side, but unfortunately at the moment, they're collaborating with the Germans. And this attack by the French was the first time that the um, Australia fired its guns in anger 
And the reason why the French were very quick to attack, not just HMAS Australia, but any British units was because of this. Okay, now we're just gonna take a little aside because the next few things we're gonna look at, um, one of the main causes is because of this. So on July the 3rd, only a couple of weeks after France fell, the French Navy, main units of the French Navy that still were not stuck in Toulon or Brest were able to escape to North Africa. And at first there had been some talk that these ships might be able to join with the British Navy. But after the Germans pretty much told the Vichy government that you are uh, being tolerated uh, and if you make a slip up, we will occupy the rest of France. Um, the French Navy decided that they must remain neutral, at least, in the situation. And the British were given many reassurances that the French Navy would rather scuttle itself than join the Germans. However, Churchill didn't believe it. And he sent Admiral Somerville with a Mediterranean fleet, uh, mainly consisting of the battleships <coughs> Pardon me, mainly consists of battleships, um, I think Resolution, um, and of course the battle cruiser Hood, to either get the French to join us, to scuttle their ships, and if not, sink them. So Admiral Somerville, who knew many of these French admirals, um, sent an envoy into Mers El Kabir to talk to Admiral Jean Soule and to try and get one of these options happening. Jean Soule gave his word as an admiral that they would never join the Germans, uh, but they would never, unfortunately, be able to join the British either, that of course they would never scuttle their ships. And as far as the British were concerned, and, and Somerville actually hedged on this for quite a while until he was given an unequivocal order to open fire from London, which he did. And the French ships were against the long mole. They were moored. They were not cleared for action. And the British opened fire. Uh, aircraft from uh, British aircraft carrier dropped mines, and it was a slaughter. Three of the uh, French battleships were sunk. 1,300 French officers and sailors were killed and you can bet that Vichy France uh, would not let this go unhindered. And I spent a bit of time on that because it brings up the next situation in which HMAS Australia would find itself involved. So Operation Menace, another bright idea from Churchill. So he had General de Gaulle on his hands. He was the leader of the Free French that is the opposite to the Vichy French, um, those Frenchmen um, who wanted to fight against the Germans at all costs. And so they came up with an idea that Dakar, a port on the West African coast, could easily be captured by um, free French forces. And this would be a free French victory, a great propaganda victory as well, by the way. And that, you know, Dakar, it will be a useful strategic naval base. And also, again, Churchill thinking about what we could add to the Allied fleet. Um, the battleship Richelieu, which was a very powerful modern uh, French battleship, was at Dakar at that time. And the planners envisaged a quick campaign. They'll just, you know, we'll just go ashore and they will surrender immediately. And here's a quick map to look at where this was happening. So you can see here the bulge of the West African coast. Okay, you see uh, Dakar itself in Senegal. These arrows show the course of three French light cruisers that were able to slip through uh, the British in the Mediterranean and actually reach uh, Sen uh, Senegal uh, and Dakar or Libreville. And they were intercepted by Force M. Now, HMAS Australia was part of that force. 
And what HMAS Australia came upon was the French light cruiser Gloire. Okay, now that's a hard one to pronounce, Gloire. Okay, which means glory. So one of the three fast light cruisers that were sent, HMAS Australia intercepted Gloire, which was dead in the water with engine trouble. The other two uh, light cruisers slipped into Dakar, no problems, they escaped. But Gloire was sitting there uh, pretty much helpless. And HMAS Australia was cruising slowly in a circle around this cruiser with its turrets trained and ready to fire. Ross Smith was not just an excellent seaman, but he was someone who understood what war was. And he also had a bit of a soft spot for the French, I think, because he negotiated the parole and trusted the French uh, ship once they were able to fix their engines slightly to go back to Casablanca, which is, you know, on the North African coast, which is quite a trip, and to inter itself in the harbour of Casablanca under the honour of parole. And it's exactly what the French ship did. I mean, mind you, eight eight-inch guns trained at you, um, you'd be pretty stupid to do something else to try and make a run for it, especially I think the ship could only do about five or six knots after it repaired its engine. Um, so that was the first incident. And I can tell you there were some pretty itchy fingers on the, on the gun triggers while they were circling around this ship. And then a day or two later, the actual landings happened at Dakar and they were strongly resisted by the Vichy French. Now, HMAS Australia, for the first time, came under fire from another warship. The French had built three classes of super destroyers, as they were called, um, basically small light cruisers. They had unbelievable speed of 37 knots, which for a sizable ship is pretty amazing. So this super destroyer, La Audacieux, which means the audacious one, uh, boldly attacked came out of Dakar Harbour, heading straight for HMAS Australia, which was firing its guns in support of the naval landing, uh, sorry, the army landing. And um, th the captain of Australia uh, obviously sees it as a threat. And one of the very first salvos straddles Le Dacier, which is like pretty good shooting. And then fires eight salvos. Okay, so eight salvos of from eight eight-inch guns, that's 64 shells. Okay, 64 eight-inch shells with deadly accuracy. And La Dacier, as you can see on the right, became an absolute wreck. Now, one of the things that stands out to me, uh, again, from Captain Ross Stewart, is that the Australian sailors young men, never been in a war, um, never understood really at this stage what war can do. Um, and understandably so, they were jubilant, they were cheering, they had just sunk their, or not sunk, but they pretty much destroyed their first enemy ship. And Ross Smith, uh, sorry, Ross Stewart, uh, angrily reminded the crew that these people who are many of them dead and wounded, no doubt, had been our allies not long ago. And this kind of made a lot of young men think twice about what war is. So again, HMAS Australia continues the bombardment of Vichy ships inside Dakar Harbour. Australia engages the two light cruisers that had escaped. They scored hits, but now the sailors could see what war could be that they are hit by two shells in return. Luckily for HMAS Australia, the damage is light and no one was seriously hurt. However, the Seagull, which had been spotting the fall of shot, uh, the small amphibian aeroplane uh, was engaged by French fighters. And like I said before, it's a very slow aeroplane. It has hardly any maneuverability and the French fighters shot it down very quickly. Unfortunately, the crew was lost they did mount a bit of a search, 
but they couldn't find them. And these were the pretty much the first fatalities that the ship suffered. And like, and, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm down on Churchill too much here, but again, like many of his bright ideas, uh, it didn't work. The um, actual invasion was um, a failure and Operation Menace was cancelled when the battleship resolution was torpedoed by a French submarine. Um, wasn't sunk, but it had to be taken under tow and the British fleet decided that discretion was the better part of valour. And it's a very interesting incident that happened in October of 1940. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so the ship was told that there was a Royal Air Force Coastal Command Sunderland flying boat that was lost. It had crashed in the sea, it was out of fuel and had to go down. So HMS Australia was dispatched to find and rescue the crew and the seas were towering. If you look at that centre photo, and that's an amazing photo, okay, you see the Sunderland, which is the aircraft you can see on the photograph on the left, upside down, um, half sunk in the water. So that's the actual bottom part of the aeroplane. If you look behind, that's not a sea that is in, going into the distance. That is a wave coming towards um, the Sunderland. And you see perched on the rear um, part of the actual aeroplane upside down is a human, is a person, is one of the crew members. So you see the scale of the seas that were involved. So they could not launch their boats. Um, it was impossible to launch boats off HMAS Australia in a sea like this. Ross Stewart showed how skillful he was as a ship handler. He closed towards where he could see there were um, seamen in the water uh, and the actual wreck of the plane itself. And Jamie Armstrong, who at this time, I think was the executive officer of HMAS Australia, he led a, a group of volunteer swimmers. And you know, those Aussies, they're pretty damn good swimmers compared to unfortunately most Englishmen in these days. And they jumped in the water with ropes around them, obviously, uh, and rescued as many men as they could. And most of these Royal Air Force guys were really at the end of their tether. They had been in the water, the water was freezing. Um, they had life jackets on apparently, but um, they definitely thought they were gonna be going under. So nine of the crew were rescued. That's an amazing fact that um, Armstrong and his volunteers were able to do this. Three other men were lost in the water. And the most terrible aspect in a way, this fellow who's sitting on the actual airplane itself, they had to leave him behind because the ship could not um, be side on to such waves like that. Uh, apparently from what I read, they could not stay in the area. They had to leave the area and they could not rescue this fellow. Um, and you can imagine how they must have felt to leave him behind sitting there on the upturned section of the airplane to his fate, which were obviously wouldn't have been very good. So we're gonna have a, a little bit of a look at some of the people or some of the snapshots of the crew here. And as I say there, they came from every part of Australia to serve on HMAS Australia. And you can see there that the crew of the Aussie, you can see some blokes there who are definitely experienced sailors. You can see some very young faces there, um, all different types all different persuasions, um, but all with one thing in common, to serve their country aboard the Aussie. And some of the snapshots of life aboard the ship. Okay, one of the things that was probably feared or not feared, but definitely disliked more than anything was all the spit and polish. Okay, we're going back to port. Everything has to be gleaming. 
And you can see here the sailor who's climbed out onto the muzzle of one of the eight inch guns, uh, cleaning the tampions, uh, which were made out of brass and they had to gleam and sparkle. Um, a relaxed shot of pom-pom gunners taking a break uh, later in the war from the attacks of bombers and kamikaze. And um, the seagull was replaced and there was a new crew. It's interesting to note that um, part of the crew and maintenance of the amphibian were not from the Royal Australian Navy. They were actually from the Royal Australian Air Force. And we have here a new war for HMAS Australia. And that is after Pearl Harbor, the rise of Japan and the spread of the Japanese throughout Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Okay, a very famous propaganda poster on the left that scared the bejesus out of a lot of people in Australia, especially women, because um, of how Japan had treated China in uh, the Chinese Sino-Japanese War and how um, Chinese civilians had been slaughtered in places like Nanjing. So that was very effective propaganda. And you can see the extent of the Japanese empire by mid 1942, which will bring us up to the Battle of the Coral Sea. And a new uh, commander in chief of the Australian squadron and the first Australian born commander of the Australian squadron. Uh, he had served in HMAS Australia one. Uh, Kreis had also been a torpedo officer in HMS Hood. He was actually a, a specialist in torpedoes. He was appointed the Rear Admiral commanding the Australian squadron. And to begin with, he was a very unhappy man because the Australian, because he was actually stationed here eventually, and there were no major units of the Australian Navy uh, in Australia. They were all over the world and nowhere near where he was. And he wanted, obviously, uh, some sort of squadron or fleet to command. Eventually, of course, after Pearl Harbor, uh, that happened. Ships were sent back to Australia. And uh, his force was designated Task Force 44. Uh, it was composed not only of Australian ships, but some United States Navy ships as well, primarily, uh, mainly the USS Chicago, another heavy cruiser. And he did not have the best relationship with Admiral Fletcher, the American commander in this part of the world. Uh, and, and we'll see that Fletcher definitely, and he is actually a very controversial figure, um, kind of neglected uh, Kreis and Task Force 44, which had a very important part at Coral Sea. So he Kreis flew his flag in HMAS Australia. And another personality that was very important at this time uh, was, rear, um, as he would be one day, Rear Admiral Farncombe. Okay, he had been already the executive officer on HMAS Australia on its world cruise. Uh, a very quiet spoken man, uh, very professional, very absorbed by his job and his duty. He had been trained at Osborne House, which somebody mentioned before, and uh, at Jarvis Bay. He attended the Royal Navy Staff College and the Imperial Defence College in 1927. That means if you're going to these places, you are, you are earmarked for greatness one day. He was seen by the crew as strict but fair when he was the exec officer. He had a nickname of Fearless Frank during the war because of his aggressive approach and he would become captain of HMAS Australia in time for the Battle of the Coral Sea. So one of the first tasks that um, Task Force 44 had to do was to actually uh, get to know the ways of the United States Navy, because now, um, as Curtin famously said, we look to the United States, not to say that we don't appreciate Britain, but Sorry, you guys can't do much for us at the moment. So we look to America. Again, Kreis is not happy uh, because one of the first things they have to do is to escort a tanker. And as he said, huh, not to shoot Japs because that's what Kreis wanted to do, shoot Japs. 
he really wanted to uh, bombard Rabaul. Uh, instead, he was sent with HMS Australia on an escort mission. And I'll very briefly mention the murder that happened aboard HMAS Australia. Okay, so Stoker, John Riley, was found bleeding, knifed uh, repeatedly on the upper deck of the ship. Now, you can imagine this is something that, as far as I know, had never happened aboard a ship of the Royal Australian Navy before. Um, there was a court-martial for murder by two shipmates of uh, Riley. Um, apparently, Riley uh, was accusing them of having uh, what you would call, I suppose, today, a same-sex relationship. Um, it's kind of a bit confusing, the case, especially to Farncombe. Farncombe had a very difficult duty to prosecute a court-martial, <coughs> pardon me, without any real um, knowledge of law. He wasn't a lawyer. He was a very um, skillful captain of a ship, but eventually that was done. And I would recommend, if you want to know more about this, to read Mike Carlton's book, Flagship, because there's a lot of information about that. And here I'm primarily involved in looking at the ship's historical record during the war right now. Okay, so the Battle of the Coral Sea. HMS Australia leads Task Force 44, looking for the Japanese invasion fleet. Crace is on the blower repeatedly looking for some information or direction from Fletcher. Okay, Fletcher is, I don't know, either where he was too involved in what he was doing or he just really couldn't be bothered to answer back. Um, Crace was given no information, virtually none. Okay, so Farncombe made a, a very good team with Kreis, and they were both a bit befuddled, but they kind of followed what orders they had that was heading towards pretty much um, the southern, uh, southeastern coast of New Guinea, looking for the Japanese invasion force. And they then came under attack by the Japanese air force based at Rabaul. Okay, and you can see there a great photo of HMAS Australia under air attack. They were under attack from a collection of different types of Japanese planes, Zeeks, um, Betty bombers and Nels. Um, some of them were dropping bombs from high level. Uh, the Bettys were torpedo bombers. Um, Kreis um, repeatedly asked Fletcher for air cover. None arrived. There were none. And there were uh, two American aircraft carriers, including um, the Lexington, which carried a hell of a lot of airplanes and lots of fighter planes, uh, but unfortunately, Task Force 44 were on their own. The torpedo bombers concentrated, obviously, on the biggest ships, uh, which were Australia and Chicago, and Farncombe was consummate in his skill under fire. He was cool as a cucumber, as they say. He saw the torpedoes drop. He saw and, and calculated where the torpedoes would be and where his ship would be. And there were no doubt a few sort of close looks from other people on the bridge as to say, well, are we going to turn? Are we going to turn? And um, Farncombe gave the order to turn and three torpedoes went by and missed the ship. And uh, if it wasn't for Farncombe's skill and coolness under fire, perhaps... Um, you know, to be hit by three torpedoes would have been pretty much the end of Australia. And here's this fantastic painting that um, was brought to my attention um, by Randall Wilson that was commissioned by uh, Bruce Law, whose father served on HMAS Australia from 1939 to 1942. And you can see there um, what I would take to be Farncombe taking evasive action while under air attack. Fantastic painting, indeed. Okay, so a little bit more on the Coral Sea. Um, there are more attacks. Uh, but the worst thing is that later on, Task Force 44 was actually attacked by a group of American B-17 Flying Fortresses, um, which is not a good thing. But luckily, 
And as Admiral Kreiss very angrily informed the Americans, um, you know, your blokes are trying to sink our ships. Thank God you blokes couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. And maybe you could take a lesson from the Japanese or words to that effect. And the upshot, according to Carlton's book, is that Japanese pilots mistakenly reported Australia as a battleship. And this influenced the Japanese admiral, Inouye, to cancel the invasion of Port Moresby, which of course would lead to the overland uh, campaign of the Kokoda Tract. And again, you can see more photographs of Hobart and Australia under air attack. And another commander of the Royal Australian Navy Squadron. So Crutchley replaces Kreis eventually towards the end or towards the latter part in 1942. And this guy had a very dis distinguished career. He was at the Battle of Jutland on HMS Centurion, British battleship. He won the VC on the second raid at Ostend, which were part of a, a series of raids uh, by Commander Keyes or Commodore Keyes as he was um, against Zabruga, which is um, the U-boat base in Belgium. He commanded HMS Warspite, the famous British battleship at the Second Battle of Narvik in Norway where Warspite sailed into the fjords to hunt down a group of German destroyers. Uh, you can imagine the looks on the German destroyer captain's faces when they saw a 15 inch gun battleship sailing into a narrow fjord and pretty much blew the Germans out of the water. So he was, you know, an aggressive commander, that's for sure. And he set about exercising Task Force 44 as a cohesive unit and he would be in command till June 44, and later on after the war, commanding officer at Gibraltar. And the sister ship of HMAS Australia, unfortunately, came to grief at Guadalcanal. And it was almost the swan song for HMAS Australia too. They had both taken part in the bombardment of Tulagi, which is a small island off Guadalcanal, and they had been given the task of patrolling and guarding the stretch of water known as the slot, uh, which is a channel leading up to Guadalcanal. Uh, Crutchley was in charge of the cruisers, which were both mostly American uh, and Australian. And he was called to a conference by US Admiral Kelly Turner aboard his flagship. Turner was actually in charge of the landing fleet for the Marines landing on Guadalcanal. Fletcher, again, was in charge of the carrier task force, which actually had deserted Turner. And that's one of the reasons why they wanted to have a bit of a chat. And uh, Crutchley decided to take Australia uh, some many miles to see Turner. And um, while that happened, the Japanese under Admiral Mikawa uh, sinks four cruisers, three American, and of course, HMAS Canberra at the Battle of Savo. The Japanese are specialists at night fighting. They have amazing coordination. They also have what are called long lance torpedoes, which are absolutely deadly, as well as excellent um, fire control. So unfortunately, Canberra um, was a wreck. There was much loss of life. And Crutchley was, you know, accused of basically deserting his command at one stage. But when all the information and facts came through, he was exonerated. Unfortunately, that didn't mean much to the crew members who survived and to the families of those who did not from HMAS Canberra. So by this stage of the war, and I'm sorry, I know I'm going a bit over time, but um, by this stage of the war, there were two separate pathways to defeat Japan, shall we say. The northern track that you see here would be primarily uh, Admiral Nimitz's, uh, the commander in chief of the American Navy in the Pacific. His plan was to go through in the northern area and to attack these Japanese outposts, Tarawa, Kwailine, Saipan, Guam, the Marianas, Iwo Jima, <coughs> and finally Okinawa so that American bombers could directly uh, reach Japan and 
basically destroy Japanese cities and therefore hopefully end the war. And then you had this southern track here, which was a plan by the very colorful General MacArthur, which uh, led to the Philippines, as he once said, uh, when he left the Philippines in retreat, I shall return. And so he wanted to make good on that promise. He had already been in charge of Australian forces uh, in the New Guinea area. And um, in the end, uh, President Roosevelt had to make a decision and he decided, and this is an amazing thing that just shows you how much resources the American had, he decided to go with both. So a double pronged um, strategy to destroy Japan's empire in the Pacific. HMAS Australia would be part of this Southern thrust and it would be uh, under the command of the US uh, Seventh Fleet. So MacArthur's drive to the Philippines, HMAS Australia and the Royal Australian Navy now form Task Force 74 as part of the United States Seventh Fleet. Um, as they were basically cruising along day after day, week after week, their main mission was gunfire support because the Japanese Navy uh, was not showing itself yet uh, in any surface engagements. So like so many other heavy units, not only of the Australian Navy, but the American Navy, the main mission was to support gun, uh, was to support the troops landing in places like this, Cape Gloucester, Manus, Hollandia, and these were not just American troops, but Australian soldiers as well. They came under air attack many times, notably at Biak. And at one stage, it looked like they may be able to hunt down a squadron of Japanese destroyers. But unfortunately, because they really wanted to have a surface action, it was unsuccessful. The Japanese ships were pretty fast and got away in the night. And we have here a new commander of the Australian squadron. Collins, uh, a very different man to Farncombe. Uh, he was a gunnery officer aboard HMS Australia in the 1930s. Um, he was, the, of course, the famous man who took command of HMAS Sydney and sunk the Bartolomeo Colleoni. Um, and he would command HMAS Shropshire. That's the heavy cruiser that the British loaned to us to replace Canberra. And in October 1944, he was promoted to Commodore Australian Squadron. Um, a very genial man, apparently, also a member of um, polite high society um, in Sydney uh, before and during the war when he could, uh, a very different personality to Farncombe. And skipper of HMAS Australia is now Emile Deschener. Okay, I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, Captain, he's an excellent officer and man. He's, he's had a wide ranging career, both in the Atlantic and now in the Pacific. Okay, so as skipper, his main job is to, as I say, gunfire support. And on Trafalgar Day, the 21st of October, the ship is doing its mission uh, Deschener is on the compass platform with the other officers around him. And um, there is a sighting that has been mistaken. They thought um, they were allied airplanes because the Americans had so many aircraft carriers and so many airplanes in the air, it was hard to tell. And the, um, the Val dive bomber from a distance looked a lot like the American Dauntless dive bombers. And um, it was too late when they realized that these three airplanes are Japanese. And some people say that um, these attacks at Lady Gulf in October 1944 were the first actual kamikaze attacks uh, on Allied ships. So both Shropshire and Australia came under attack. Here you see one of the valve dive bombers. Okay, one of the attacking planes is hit repeatedly by an aircraft fire, but it comes on regardless, low over the port quarter and dives into the ship. 
it crashed into the port side of the forward tripod mast, clipped the funnel. And even though the airplane, um, most of the airplane itself fell over the side, there was a massive explosive fireball uh, because the actual um, fuel aboard the, the airplane uh, detonated as well as perhaps one of the bombs. Okay, this would have uh, catastrophic results. Okay, later on when it goes to Manus Island, you see the kind of damage that this aeroplane inflicted as it came down this angle. And of course, that's all fire blackened as well. Okay, so Deschener and his guys would have been in this area here, and there were many others in anti-aircraft positions, etc., around. So Collins is badly injured. Deschener will soon die, unfortunately, from the burns and from a, a stomach wound that he sustained in the attack. So this fireball and shrapnel not only kills the two top men on the ship, but 36 sailors as well, and 65 are wounded very seriously. Okay, so the ship returns to Manus Island to repair the damage on the 27th of October. And the crew is uh, mourning the loss of their captain, whom they liked very much, and mourning the loss of their shipmates. And they are then told to parade on the quarter deck of the ship. And they think that, okay, so we're going to be basically told, okay, guys, you did a good job. And, you know, it's terrible what happened, but we're going to have to go back to the war and we're going to have to fight and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and um, the fellow you see there, Vice Admiral Guy Royal, who happens to be um, the number one person in charge of the Australian Navy board, I think at this time, boards the ship. He happens to be at Manus Island. And he, uh, he tells the fellows, well, just think that those men who died would have been very proud to die on Trafalgar Day. Okay, well, maybe but actually this caused a lot of unrest and a feeling of disgust amongst the men on the ship. Um, they weren't thinking that anybody would be proud to die on any day, Trafalgar day or not. And they missed their friends and they missed their captain. And so this was a pretty insensitive thing for Royal to say. And on the left, you see some of the damage incurred. So back to the Philippines, Battle of Lingayen Gulf. Farncombe now replaces Collins as the Commodore of the Australian Squadron. And Jamie Armstrong, the hero of that rescue attempt on the Sunderland, is now captain. So they take repairs. They decide we need more 40 millimeter Bofors guns. And there's a wonderful story how the, the captain of the Shropshire sends his executive officer to the American um, quartermasters aboard, uh, aboard ships on Manus Island and gives them cases of Scotch whiskey for both his guns. And actually Shropshire alone is given uh, 13 new both his guns to be mounted on the ship and American CBs or combat engineers are actually there to put the guns on the ship. Australia also gains some of these guns, but not as many. And when they arrive off Lingay and Gulf, they encounter the divine wind or kamikazes. Uh, and Australia and Shropshire, for whatever reason, seem to be singled out by the Japanese for special treatment. Okay, so here's the rundown on what happens over a period of days. From the 5th to the 9th, uh, HMAS Australia was repeatedly attacked by kamikazes. A Zeke fighter, first of all, crashed into the port side, four inch anti-aircraft guns, 25 were killed and 30 wounded. So that was pretty grievous loss right there and then. The next day, a Val dive bomber hit Australia on the starboard side guns. So these are the four inches on the other side, 14 killed and quite a few wounded. Next day, two diner bombers crash into Australia. Okay, so here's a picture of a diner you can pack a lot of explosive into one of these light bombers. And uh, 
the two bombers crashing into the side of the ship actually caused uh, HMAS Australia to list to port quite heavily. Finally, on the same day, a Val dives into the area yet again behind the bridge and demolishes the forward funnel. So the ship is taking massive punishment, but all the time it's fighting back. Okay, so HMAS Australia earns the admiration of the Seventh Fleet for its actions over that period of days at Lingayen Gulf. 44 men are killed and 69 wounded by the kamikaze attacks over that period of time. One of the reasons why HMAS Australia keeps fighting uh, is the fellow on the left, Lieutenant David Hamer, who is recommended for the Victoria Cross and gets the Distinguished Service Cross instead. So just a couple of things about that. Why was he recommended? He was recommended because in one that last attack uh, by the Val dive bomber that crashed into the back of the uh, forward superstructure, he actually stood atop his position, shaking his fist as the, as the Japanese Val dive bomber was approaching him at speed and shook his fist, screaming his head off with a whole bunch of um, probably unprintable words. And for whatever reason, the Japanese plane actually, uh, instead of crashing straight into that position, um, kind of went over, clipped the top of the funnel, which you can see there, that's the actual wreck of the funnel behind him and here. And that deflected the, the um, plane. And even though it did still sort of crash into the ship, it didn't cause as much damage as it could have. This inspired the rest of the crew. The rest of the crew uh, couldn't believe when they heard what had happened, that this fellow, young fellow, who was very much liked by the crew had done this. And so not only for that, but also for his um, unrelenting work in directing the anti-aircraft fire of the ship was put up for a VC. The story why he didn't get the VC, because actually apparently uh, Royal, that f same person who was pretty insensitive, interviewed Hamer and um, thought he was a wonderful chap and um, authorized, or, or shall we say, said that, yeah, he should get the VC. But the Americans apparently said, we don't want um, word of the kamikazes getting out. And we, so therefore, we don't want this young fellow to get the Victoria Cross because of all the publicity and that would give also publicity about the kamikazes. Anyway, that's the story I read. So he gets a Distinguished Service Cross, and finally, that's the end of the war because the ship is now damaged severely and needs to be repaired uh, fully. So we finally get to the final years. Obviously, by the time the ship is repaired, the war is over. HMAS Australia, uh, will eventually return to Australia and it's put into fleet reserve and recommissioned in 1947. It's deployed to Southeast Asian waters for goodwill cruises to New Zealand and Fiji. Um, it takes part in a mercy dash to the Australian um, Antarctic South Pole Station to take aboard a seriously ill scientist in 1950. It also takes part in the Royal Visit of Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh in 1954, and it fires its guns for the last time to commemorate the Battle of the Coral Sea. And you can see there on the bottom right, um, the crew and the Queen and her husband, the Duke, at the time of 1954. So when we get to 1955, the ship is put into mothballs. It's a bit of a fuzzy shot there, but it shows a color shot of HMAS Australia, and it's at rest in Sydney Harbour before its final scrapping. A gallant ship sailed by gallant men. And of course, lest we forget what this ship did and the men aboard, and lest we forget the memory, as it says there, of the 87 officers and men who were killed on this ship fighting during World War II. And here are the sources that I used for my presentation. Mostly uh, flagship, as I said, but 
lots of information online. And thank you. And any questions or discussion, if there's anybody no, still you. out there. No, no questions. Just Christine here from the HMAS Australia Veterans Association. Just Hi, want to say congratulations, Kez, on a great job. And thank you very much. And all of our participants are still watching and still still got their names at the top there. So they're all very keen and uh, and just very appreciative of the whole attention and how much your attention to detail. And just on behalf of all of us, we'd just like to say a big thank you. Kez, I, I particularly valued the, the presentation because it, it's so comprehensive and, and you really gave us the strategic context as well. I and mean, it's all very well just to talk about the individual actions that a ship goes through in its life, but but to appreciate you know, the, the broader context. Uh...